That's not the Latin, is it? <laughs> Uh, exactly. Thank you all for being here. As you know, uh, for those of you who have been following Civil Beat, this is our third Civil Cafe at the legislature. The first one uh, was in January, the beginning. Then we had a mid-session wrap-up, and this is our concluding panel. Uh, just a couple of notes. Uh, we are not live, but we are recording this. We will be posting this to our webpage later. Uh, previous legislative sessions, our Civil Cafes rather, are also posted on our website. Um, remember to silence your phones, please. Very important. <laughs> Thank you very much. And let's be civil. That's the first word in our title. Well, I guess Honolulu is the first word in our title, but everyone calls us Civil Beat. Some people call us The Civil Beat. Civil. Yeah, The Civil Beat. Some call us The Beat. Mm, okay, anyway. Um, so thank you all. Um, I'm very delighted to have uh, two members of the leadership for the House and Senate here today, uh, Majority Leader Jay Kalani English to my left, and House Speaker Scott Psyche to my right. And then to the far left and far right, far left first is Courtney T, my comrade in arms covering the legislature from Civil Beat. <coughs> and to my far right is Corey Tanita, not Tanita, <laughs> Corey Tanita from Common Cause. And the way this is gonna work is I'm gonna make a few opening remarks. I'm gonna turn it over to the Majority Leader and the Speaker. Uh, for their comments about priorities, accomplishments during the session, and then to Courtney and Corey for their comments as well, bills that they were tracking, and then we're trying to reserve a lot of time for questions. We have a whole bunch of questions that came in beforehand online, and we also are going to ask you in the audience if you wish to contribute your own question. There are note cards, is that right, Mariko? So you can see Mariko wearing the Civil Beach shirt, and then, who else? Ben? Has Ben got his own? Yeah, our, my colleague Ben in the back in the gray Civil Beach shirt. Hi. <laughs> so if you have questions, what we don't do is we're not going to come around and give you a microphone to talk. Sorry, we're just not going to do that. Instead, you need to write out the question, and then Ben and Mariko will feed Courtney and Corey uh, to ask those questions. Okay, have I got anything else that I'm missing? No, Common Cause is a, is a sponsor of one of these. We the, are. The Thank you. Thing. Yeah, just, I just want to say there's seats in the front if you guys want to come up. And let's go ahead and move the microphones a little bit closer so that everybody can hear. I have a loud voice, but uh, majority leader and speaker are somewhat soft-spoken. <laughs> if everybody's ready to begin, I think we're going to begin right now. Um, I have a story that's up in Civil Beat today calling this the most progressive uh, legislative session in recent memory. I've already got a few emails telling me, really? Uh, there were some people in particular, particularly women, who said that the paid family leave uh, bill, uh, which is calling for a study, was a great disappointment, a letdown to women, because it calls for a study. And the argument I heard was that the study is already in and that they should have acted on it. The paid family leave bill was a priority of the Women's Caucus. Uh, nonetheless, it, it is passed. There is a related bill that I believe sets up a board in the Department of Labor. Is that right? I'm looking at Della and she's saying perhaps no. Majority Leader Della Albalotti is in the audience as well. Um, I was also uh, told by several people dis upset about a domestic violence legislation that did not make it as well. And this came from several, several uh, other people. So I did want to acknowledge that. Uh, Richard Cregan is in the audience as well, representative over there. Senator Stanley Chang, Senator, Senator Chang is in the audience too. Please point them out as they come in. Thank you all. Uh, but mostly I got a lot of good emails, including from someone, a text. I will not identify who the person is. But they said, it's, it's someone here in this building. And they said, wow. This is the first time you've called us progressive. <laughs> <laughs> this was at uh, 6.47 a.m., so they were getting up and reading Civil Beat first thing. So I texted back and said, probably the last time, too. <laughs> With a little smiley face. And then this person says, I will have to save this article. <laughs> to check back, I guess, is the way to do it. I don't know what so, uh, so that was that was something nice, but I really do. I'll, I'll, I'll admit that I. That I'll, I'll admit I wrote that text at 6:47 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Please bring the microphone closer to you. Okay. Actually, we need to hear about six inches. <laughs> Say again, Senator. Er, about this far apart. Uh, about is this best like this? Yeah. Thank you. They have much more experience with the microphones than I do. Um, but um, I do feel that way. There was so many bills that surprised me. I would have to start with the medical aid and dying bill, a bill that we saw die last year in the House, uh, and yet it passed, and it passed overwhelmingly, and that's quite a remarkable development given its long history in this building. Certainly the 
the sunscreen bill, the two chemicals being banned with the uh, exception of prescription. I'm told that was the first of its kind legislation in the country. I hope I have that right. There was the pesticides bill, uh, the one that's going to ban, uh, I'm going to ask someone to pronounce that name for me. Is it chlorpyrifos? Is that how it's correct? Dr. Cregan, thank you very much. Um, oh, that is going to be banned by 2022, I believe. But uh, in the meantime, you can get a temporary permit to use that. There will also be buffer zones around schools. Uh, Ohana zones, a controversial idea. I'll be curious to see what the governor does in terms of whether he will veto it or accept it, but $30 million plus to set up uh, really legal, safe, homeless encampments, three on Oahu, uh, one each on Hawaii Island, Kauai, and Maui. I could go on and on. I do want to mention one other bill that I did not include in my wrap-up, but this is from Suvon Lee, my colleague, who covers education. Hawaii moved a step closer to expanding protections for students discriminated against on the basis of sex, gender identity, or sexual orientation. That's because a bill, uh, which is essentially a corollary to the Title mm -hmm. IX federal law. Okay, Kat and Henry are looking at me saying, no, that did not pass. <laughs> it, no, it passed, passed but, but, weak. oh, I've got a but here. I'm coming to the but. <laughs> but the bill was uh, weakened significantly, trimmed most recently in the enforcement arena. There was provision giving the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission the jurisdiction to field student complaints and issue a right to sue letter against a state-funded education program. Instead, it calls for, you ready for it? The Legislative Reference Bureau to conduct a study, which is sort of a classic thing that the legislature does. Did I get that right, Henry and Kat? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. It would have to be egregious. Okay, that's fine. Uh, it is interesting how uh, calling a study is often uh, the solution to a, a situation and those studies come back to the legislature they are reported I'll let the majority leader and the speaker tell you more about that but I did overall think it was a pretty remarkable session and my compliments <coughs> to both the House and Senate just as someone who's a resident citizen of Hawaii I'm not saying the session was perfect but I was definitely impressed I do want to end with one other note I wondered did not mention this but I wondered how much maybe the speaker the majority leader might comment I wonder how much this was a reaction to the Trump administration. There's, uh, yeah, yeah, some people are going, really, what? Uh, compared to what's going on in Congress right now, which is controlled by the Republicans, as well as the Trump White House, um, it's kind of remarkable, I think, what, what has happened. And it, I wondered whether there might be something to that. And before we go into their opening remarks, could I just ask the majority leader and the speaker, was there any consideration of sending a message to Washington and being anti-Trump at all? Majority Leader? Well, I, th <coughs> I think in the Senate we took a very pragmatic approach. I mean, basically we looked at programs that will be cut or may be cut and we tried to replace it with state monies. Uh, programs that we thought would be beneficial a lot in the environmental protection area, a lot in um, climate change areas. Uh, you know, a lot of our federal highway monies, for example, um, you know, our roads, a lot of our roads are being eroded and so that would have been under the uh, climate change um, initiatives that the previous administration had. So that was replaced. So we took a pragmatic approach. Yes, we did uh, take into account the current administration in Washington. Of course, you have to. Uh, but very, very, uh, like I said, pragmatic. We didn't like say, okay, you know, the, the, the union is breaking up and we're out on our own and we're going to have to um, go on it on our own but we do know that we have to pick up a lot. And one area that I think we all saw with was with the storms. You know, the storms on Kauai and the storms on Maui, um, the storms that are going to happen in the future, will only get worse and worse and more intense. And one of the big tension points is the federal flood insurance and the reimbursements from FEMA. Uh, and so, you know, that's an area that we're gonna have to look very, very carefully at because more and more Hawaii will have to pay for our own insurance and our own rebuilding as the storms come. Uh, I, I know Senator Ross Baker, one of the, her priority bills has to do with making certain that parts of Obamacare are preserved yes. locally, and I'm looking at the majority leader for the House nodding her head as well. Uh, Speaker Saiki, that question about President Trump, uh, majority leader English saying, not a total reaction, but yeah, some of the, some of the bills. I think so for, from the House perspective, um, we were pretty much in line with the Senate's um, position on this. What the House really did was at the outset was to focus on a couple of areas. One was the impact of federal cuts on Hawaii, um, especially in the, um, in the, within the Medicaid <coughs> area, uh, because Medicaid is now the largest um, expenditure um, in this for the, under the state budget. We're, we spend more in medical programs mm -hmm. than we do 
on public education at this point because of the rising costs. And so we're really concerned about mitigating the impact of federal cuts uh, within the Medicaid program. The other area that we focused on was um, the, with what is kind of like a, uh, a, like a, just a normal procedure where we go through internal revenue code conformity issues and whether or not the state should conform to changes in the re internal revenue code. But this year we actually spent a lot of time analyzing each and every uh, change in the federal tax code to see whether or not Hawaii wants to conform to the changes that were made at the fe at the federal level. And if I could stop you for just a moment, my 81-year-old mother is saying she can't hear <laughs> the speakers very well. Hi, Mrs. Blair. Uh, if you don't mind speaking <laughs> up just a little bit uh, for the benefit of those who have uh, a little more difficulty hearing. Did you hear that okay, Mom? <laughs> She's embarrassed. She's blushing. Yeah, my mom's right over there. Yeah. <laughs> How about a round of applause for Patricia Blair? <laughs> Thank you. And okay, continue. sorry. So the, uh, and the final point is that um, I think my um, suggestion to the House uh, caucus was that we not react to the federal changes, that if we are going, if we are going to uh, enact legislation in, resp in response to federal changes, that we need to be pretty thorough and just analyze what we're doing before we react. Because sometimes if you react, there could be ramifications uh, to doing that as well. Okay. Uh, so to Priorities, accomplishments, uh, disappointments in the respective chambers. We'll start with Majority Leader English regarding the Senate. What, uh, what are you proud of this session? Well, you know, I, I think I think you did sum it up nicely. You know, Thank if you, you have to use one word, it's progressive. But, but um, you know, I, what I'd like to point out is maybe the bigger macro picture. I mean, uh, the senators work nicely with each other. The House and Senate work nicely with each other. Um, for the most part, you know, compared to other times, you see somebody laughing here, but you know, that's a cynic in him. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, for given other other legislative sessions, uh, this th I think that was a difference. You know, actually talked to each other a little <coughs> bit more. The members did. Um, so, with that said, you know, I think this, the Senate uh, we abandoned the idea of um, a majority package of bills about four or five years ago. And we did that after looking at 25 years of majority packages and realizing that about 99% of them didn't pass. That much? Mm -hmm. of, wow. Yeah. So a waste of time? Well, no, but you know, the, 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 the concept of it was, was flawed. So we went to a more um, academic approach. You know, we had, uh, basically we do a, for lack of a better term, it's more than that, a retreat. We take all the senators, we go somewhere. We've been to the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. We've been to the judiciary. We've been to different um, venues. And we bring in people that, uh, academics are very smart, very, very smart people that talk about big topics. So we had the military brief us, for example, on things like pandemics, their view of <coughs> pandemics, um, infrastructure, critical infrastructure, telecommunications, um, food security, and uh, you know, those types of things. So what we went to was a, was a Senate um, legislative program. And basically we asked each senator to um, follow this program. In other words, is they're, they're doing their, creating their bills, creating their hearings for the chairs, and moving forward that they would uh, incorporate these into the bills. So a much higher rate of success. Mm -hmm. You know, one year, to about two years back, homelessness was a very was the issue for us for the Senate. We laid the groundwork for what's happening now um, with the homeless uh, situation. We changed the paradigm and the thinking on what it is. You know, we went away from you have to deal with it when the person becomes homeless. We s we went to the idea that you have to deal with it before they become homeless. And there's a spectrum to deal with the homeless situation. And you try to stop people from becoming homeless, and then you help the different categories. The year before that, uh, the Senate focused on food security because that was the biggest issue that came up for us. This year, it was uh, we focused on the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Many of you aren't familiar with it, um, but it's a global it's a global move to um, harmonize and synchronize uh, 195 countries that are member states of the UN um, and the, the sub what they call the, the sub uh, regions or the states or the provinces. Um, and it's an alignment of 17 goals um, that really encompass uh, global environmental security, food security, um, economic prosperity, and stability and peace. So 
you know, we uh, encompass that. We uh, that was the majority package, if you quote, you know, the, the <coughs> what we did. But we asked each chair to incorporate these into the bills. So if you look at many of our bills, it incorporates these 17 principles. I mean, you know, the ban on on sunscreen, for example, would deal with uh, number 14, life below water, um, responsible consumption, <coughs> number 12. Uh, so. That, that's how this, the Senate looked at it. We did have bills. We did send a bill over to the House, and uh, the House uh, withdrew its conferees. So, you know, we had a. a what was that bill? That was a, the bill that would have codified the um, sustainable development goals. Now I understand the governor's going to get and do it with the executive order. So, anyway, li at least it gets into gets into our system. Uh, the counties have adopted it. Maui County has adopted it. Other counties are looking at it, which is what we had hoped that they would do. So. Um, what the Senate did, to answer your, go back to your question, what the Senate did was looked at a comprehensive package and how things cross-connect and how they, um, how they intersect so that we can come up with a better, um, better success rate. And I think we did it because you can see in many of the bills uh, that we passed, you know, we, we can put them into all of these categories and move the whole idea forward of a comprehensive way of dealing with big issues. Thank you, Majority Leader. Uh, Mr. Sh Speaker, I wondered if you might comment on a few other things you felt good about with your chamber, as well as what the Majority Leader did, which shed a little light on how the Senate, in your case the House, went about coming up with its principles going forward for the session. Okay, so before I do that, can I introduce a couple of my colleagues who walked in? Sure. Uh, Representative Lindsay Coit is in the back of the room. Please raise it. There she is, in the back. And also Representative Mark Hashem is here. I think I saw him walk in. Where did um, Mark go? <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, anyway. so, you know, it was just, um, it was only seven months ago when we were in special session uh, on the rail issue, on the rail <coughs> tax. And, you know, after we completed, I have to say that being, that special session was probably one of the toughest things that I've worked on uh, in the legislature. And after that session was over, uh, you know, I was talking with the Senate President, Ron Kochi, and I told him, you know, after this special session and after what we did on the rail bill, whether people agree or disagreed with it, uh, it just told me that the legislature can do anything because that was a really tough issue. And I, I told him that we, it was, to me, it was a really good sign going forward uh, in terms of the House's working relationship with the Senate. And um, that's exactly, as Kalani mentioned, that's exactly uh, what transpired after that special session was that I think that there was um, an excellent working relationship between the two bodies. Uh, you know, there are times when we disagreed with each other, but it was civil and we agreed to disagree. But there were times when we agreed on some of the issues and that is the result of this session. I think that this, um, in all of my years, the legislature, this is probably has been the most uh, productive uh, session that I've been involved with. How um, long have you been in the legislature? 20, this is my 23rd year. 23rd year, So, wow. um, the, uh, and I guess it also has been a progressive, le a progressive uh, result as well. Um, the, when, the when we started in January, the House set uh, forth a couple of priorities that we're looking at. One was housing, affordable housing development, and the other was homelessness. And you know, I feel that the legislature really delivered on both of those areas. It was, you know, we're in a fortunate situation where <coughs> we actually had financial resources available to us this year. There was a, a surplus in tax collections and that enabled us to appropriate $200 million for the rental housing trust fund, which will uh, result in the construction of at least approximately a thousand units below 80% AMI and 300, a $300 million GET exemption for the construction of units between 80 and 140% AMI. The $300 million in GET tax exemptions over a 12 year period represent the construction of about 2,000 units per year. So for the 12 years that this will be in effect, we're looking at construction of, of 24,000 uh, affordable rental units. Um, that, and this, by the way, that GT exemption was something, a package that we had worked on in conjunction with labor unions, construction unions, which agreed to a pay cut 
when working on these projects. It was in conjunction with the largest banks in Hawaii, which agreed to cut its financing rates for these projects. And um, so it's, it's, it's been, it was a really concerted effort to put that bill together. Um, the other uh, bill that I'm pretty proud of is the, co the disaster relief appropriation that we uh, drafted basically within uh, just a matter of days. Hundred and twenty. It was hundred and twenty-five million dollars. Hundred million of that is allocated for Kauai, twenty-five million for other areas in the state. Um, but that was basically done over the weekend. The finance chair and the Ways and Means chair, Sylvia Luke and Donna Medela Cruz, <laughs> had to expedite the approval of the state budget bill in order to expedite the, co the disaster relief bill. So that was another historic moment in our session where the money committees had to hold only two conference meetings <coughs> to resolve the state budget. And they resolved it within a week. You know, normally that budget bill takes, takes uh, a couple of weeks to, to resolve, um, but this one was done really, really quickly. And I think that, you know, there's, I'm sure there will be questions about other areas that we've worked on, but I feel that we've, this has just been a really solid, a solid agenda. Be, and it, I think that the legislature um, really uh, delivered this year. Before we go on to Courtney and Corey, I did want to ask both leaders, <coughs> what kept you guys from working so well previously? And how do you keep that, <laughs> how do you keep that together going forward? Uh, in other words, to keep the, the good relationships, uh, with not losing this momentum, if you will. Majority Leader. Before, what, what kept... Uh, well, you know, I mean, to be, lack of to be really frank, I mean, thinking about this, you know, just as you say, sure. um, you know, in the past, the House and the Senate often viewed each other as the enemy. And that's been the problem. The, for the veterans here, you've, you've seen that, right? Well, the House is doing this, we're not going to do that. The Senate's doing this, we're not going to do that. So I think we tried to lessen that and say, you know, we're, we're two parts of a whole. And we have to work in unison to make sure things get through. Um, we also, you know, it helps to have a common enemy. Um, Is that us, the media? <laughs> no, but that's your perception of it. But we don't view you that oh, way. Oh, thank you. Um, You're on record, by the way. <laughs> You're on record, too. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the... the the thing is that, I mean, the, the common enemy with the big quote around this is really the, the federal administration, right? That's the, that was the underlying. Um, also, there's a lot of tension between the executive and the, <coughs> the um, legislative. And, you know, that's healthy. That's how the, the American founding fathers put together a representative democracy. So, you know, the idea was the tension should be between the executive and the legislative. Um, and over the, my 18, years being a senator and my, you know, many years before that working here, it's always been, the tension has always been between the House and the Senate, the Senate and the House. This is one of the first years where the tension was where it should be, was between the executive and the legislative. Uh, we also had some tension with the judiciary, uh, you know, so uh, that, that was very healthy as well. Um, they did some rulings that we thought were stepping into the uh, legislative arena, they were trying to legislate from the bench. We control the purse strings, so we said uh, no to a lot of their money. Uh, they reversed some of their uh, decisions. Uh, we gave them some money. <laughs> so the tension worked. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. So, you know, I think one of the dynamics um, that kind of changed this year was something that um, I've always kind of been concerned about um, in a one-party state where you have um, the executive and the legislature in the same party. There's been sometimes a tendency for the legislature to defer to the executive branch, and you know my uh, point to the House members uh, this year was that you know we really need to step it up and to act like a legislature. The legislature <coughs> is the branch of government that is responsible for setting policy decisions in this state. It's not the executive branch; it's the legislature because we approve the state budget. We pass laws, we pass appropriation measures. So we are able to affect policy through those decisions. And I feel like um, both in the House and in the Senate that that um, was more of a realization this year was that the legislature needed to step up to the plate to get things done. When you look at all of the uh, major accomplishments of this session, all of them, all of them initiated at the legislative level. 
and um, I think that's uh, I'm hopeful I'm really hopeful that we will continue this trend to have the legislature act as and to be the third uh, independent branch of government okay good uh, we'll be coming back to both of you with questions and by the way if you have questions just look for people <coughs> in civil league t-shirts they have little index cards there's Mariko over there Ben's floating around somewhere there we go uh, we do want your questions uh, we already have a bunch already but now I want to go to uh, Courtney Tanita from um, Corey did I say Corey? <laughs> it's been a long session, Corey. It has. Thank you. <laughs> Corey Tanita, one of my yeah, favorites. Yeah, you got my last name I got your last name pronounced yeah. correctly, unlike last time. No Common Cause, an important organization. Tell us briefly what Common Cause does, and tell us what you were focusing on this session. So Common Cause, hopefully you guys have heard of us and know of us, but we are a nonpartisan government watchdog, in so many words. So we work more on process-related issues. Uh, so ethics, transparency, uh, money and politics and so forth and voting and elections so I know you're all here to hear me talk about vote by mail uh, <laughs> so I've been talking about for a really long time and so I'm sorry sorry what is that vote by vote mail, by what mail? Is that? Did you, you know about Chad? I've never heard about it. I'm <laughs> kidding. Tell us about Vote by Mail. We have some good news we to share. We do. We finally have some good news. So this is the fourth year that it's made it through conference, and we have a pilot program for 2020 in Kauai. So yay! Um. <laughs> if, if the pilot program succeeds, yes. presumably it could be spread to the rest of the state yes we we hope so and we hope that this is the first step you know all the elections officials office of elections and all of the clerks along with you know many of you in the audience and the community members do support this program well we were hoping for a statewide program uh, we do think this is a very good first step and we have full faith and confidence in the Hawaii clerk and their team to really execute this and we will you know take lessons learned and go from there um, what else was on your plate well so along the other lines of issues that we work on, we were definitely following um, some of the transparency related bills, uh, particularly SB 2609. This is the one that would have uh, redacted uh, financial disclosure information for uh, non-paid board members and uh, for boards and volunteers, uh, excuse me, boards and commissions, those volunteers. So this would have included the, the Board of Trustees, the Land Use Commission, BLNR, DLNR, PUC, and I know Scott's kind of jumping at the bit here yeah. on this one, but you go ahead first. And, and so, so our Senator. concern with this is the fact that these are very high power, high powered boards and commissions. They make very, very big decisions that affect all of us. And what we're concerned is, you know, just a few years ago, the legislature passed the law that made these financial disclosures available. And the compromise there was to have these amounts listed in ranges. So if you own an interest in a company from like 1,000 to 10,000 or 10,000 to 25,000 and so forth. So it wasn't exact. So that was the compromise to protect uh, privacy interests of these boards and commission members, which we do respect and we do think that is necessary. But, you know, public needs to know because this is how we are able to hold power accountable, look for conflicts of interest if there are, and so forth. So, uh, very, for us, we are happy that it was, you know, it made it through conference and at the last minute, I believe it was the House that um, was, did not agree with the final version. And so, I understand the position, um, you know, sometimes there is some struggle getting to fill these boards and commissions, but we haven't seen anything that necessarily correlates with redacting this information or hiding this information to increasing uh, recruitment. You know, in our experience, we've had sessions with like the Ethics Commission and the Campaign Spending <coughs> Commission that had info briefings that really demystified the application process for people and they did see a bump in application. So for us, in our pers perspective, it's more about you know, educating the public about these opportunities, the need to fill these seats, and how to do them. But oh. you guys want to Yeah, I might just have the, the leaders uh, respond, because uh, Mr. Speaker, I believe the House version of the <coughs> bill was, you're smiling as if you know I'm gonna call <laughs> on you. Tell us the what we maybe did not understand about that bill and why you introduced it, and I'll ask the majority leader as well. So I've had several conversations with Chad uh, during the course of the session about the merits of this bill, because I actually introduced the House version of this bill, and um, uh, I so uh, just for your back for background, the financial disclosure form, which is an ethics commission form, calls for the person's name, address, phone number, employer. It also calls for their employment employment history, uh, business interests, 
real property transactions. Um, and then it also calls for, in the last column, the dollar amount attributed to each of these categories. And uh, the dollar amounts are not the specific dollar amount, but it calls for you to put in a letter, which is key to a range. Uh, so for example, ten zero to $10,000 is A, et cetera, et cetera. And the bill proposed to uh, redact <coughs> the last column, the dollar amount column. It would have left everything else intact. So it would have left business interests intact. It would have left real property uh, transactions intact. Uh, everything would have been there on the form and it would have been on the Ethics Commission website. You know, my only concern was that by requiring the disclosure of dollar amounts, it does inhibit people uh, from serving on boards and commissions. And you know, my, my general concern is that we really need to find ways to encourage all kinds of people to serve on these boards and commissions. We have so many boards, we have so many commissions where we need people to volunteer. And I felt that um, we should not uh, inhibit people from serving. The sources, if there are conflicts, the sources of those conflicts would have been disclosed. They would have been on the website. Um, you know, I would note that the city and county of Honolulu, which also has volunteers serving on boards and commissions and who are filing ethics uh, disclosures with the city ethics commission, by law, all of those disclosures are kept confidential. So none of that is on the city website. I think that we've done a lot to promote disclosure at the state level, at the ethics commission level, but providing the specific the dollar amount or the dollar <coughs> range, I think just goes a little bit too far. Okay, Majority Leader, did you want to add anything to that? I couldn't have said it better. Okay, <laughs> well enough, okay. Um, Corey, did you have anything else as well that yeah. was on the Common Cause agenda? Um, we have a lot on our agenda, but you can check it out on our website so I won't bore you. What is that. your website? Uh, hi.commoncause.org. Thank Thanks, you. Chad. You're right. Uh, <laughs> um, but I did, you know, we did spend the weekend looking at all the bills that did pass out of conference because we were concerned about the gut and replace practices that we have seen and Civil Beat has reported on throughout session. Define gut and replace just real quickly. Uh, what it sounds like, they take the contents <laughs> of one bill, gut it, uh, and put in something else. Uh, pretty much, you know, and there's different variations of this, of course, but that's pretty much it in a nutshell. And so, why is that a bad <coughs> thing from common causes and the public's point of view to gut and replace? Because it's perfectly legal. Yes, it, it is legal, but you know, the point of the legislative process is to have the public chime in, to weigh in on, and be part of these uh, in-depth discussions. And we can't do that without advance notice, without being able to see what is in the content of these bills and even now when we do have like the 48 hour notices it's very difficult to get it in by the 24 hour deadline um, you know but we do appreciate at least having that 48 hour notice and so um, and you know it's not even just for the public's sake you know sometimes this cuts out the legislators too if they don't understand how can they have intelligent discussions and conversation and debate about these complex issues these bills are not simple and so uh, the only you know, so we were expecting the worst. I mean, we saw the, as again reported on, we said, well, beat, like the, the there was an agenda by Ways and Means, like right before uh, second decking, and like a dozen bills, they all had proposed drafts. <coughs> um, so, you know, that's like already towards the end of the process that doesn't give the public much time, legislators much time to really consider what's going on. Um, but thankfully, you know, most of those really egregious bills did die. And the only one I really saw that <coughs> possibly has some issues is um, SB 2858. And that started off as requiring the Department of Public Safety to establish uh, key performance indicators on re their reentry program. And then in the, that's how it went through the Senate completely. <coughs> went to the House, it switched over to um, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it, it basically requiring the building standards so when they're building new schools that they would have to have a room in there uh, up to hurricane three standards. I guess, I guess that's, that's a public that. safety issue. Yeah, yeah, so it technically falls under the title, <laughs> but we're concerned that it doesn't fall, meet the constitutional requirement that it had three readings in each chamber. So I don't know that it necessarily had the three readings in the Senate. House, I think so. But, okay, uh, I do want to ask it did both. Come out of the Thank you for bringing gut, up, gut and replace. I do want to ask 
particularly the majority leader, it was your Ways and Means chair that in particular, his signature on these gun replace mm -hmm. bills. Yeah, and if you look at what it was, it was really bills that the, the, s that the Senate wanted that wasn't moving in the House. So, you know, that's the practice is to put it into a bill, usually in committee, um, but this time it happened in the Ways and Means um, side. And a lot of them got withdrawn as the bills were moving out of the House. So, you know, but we need to be really clear that the Constitution says you have to have one subject in each bill relating to the title. So if the title says relating to public safety, anything relating to public safety can end up in the bill at any point along the way. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's something that people have debated for a long time, but it's just one of the tools, from my point of view, one of the tools that is there, um, because sometimes we need to add things in at, at uh, a late date. Okay, speaker? So I, um, yeah, I don't, um, you know, I don't appreciate um, gut and replacing of language and bills at the last minute when there's no, um, basically no public notice of the changes. Um, but I will say that sometimes there are situations where you need to gut and replace a bill. And I'll give you an example. Um, I just mentioned, we just all mentioned the um, disaster relief bill that we approved a few weeks ago in a matter of a few days. Uh, that, was, that was kind of a gut and replace bill because we added brand new language uh, into this House bill to provide for the $125 million in funding. And the reason why we did that was because, and this was a cash infusion, it's $125 million in cash. Uh, the reports that we were getting was that it was not clear whether or not the federal government would provide uh, financing up front for projects such <coughs> as the road repair uh, in Hanalei, the road that had been washed out. So we viewed, we viewed this as um, kind of an emergency situation that we wanted, uh, wanted to respond to. Um, as a result of, of that legislation, I think you will see road repair projects starting up. You'll see other projects that will probably get reimbursed by the federal government uh, at some point but there needed to be a cash infusion um, early on in order to get those projects underway. Okay, thank you. Courtney, uh, last but not least, I think, um, actually you got one of our first questions which I think is related to one of the things you wanted to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Marijuana and police, basically, are your right. topics today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a good couple of foil bills. Um, but we got a question about the status of the legal recreational marijuana bills. I cover medical marijuana. I even had to look these up because these didn't make it anywhere. Um, you know, I'm told there's a little bit more hope next session for an adult use bill for cannabis, but you know, who knows? I think some people tend to say that every year. Um, but one of the bills that I did want to bring up that we have gotten questions about is the medical marijuana omnibus bill. An omnibus bill, just in case you don't know, is a wide ranging bill that has lots of different things in it. This one, let's start out talking about what it does. So it would establish a reciprocity program. Reciprocity is just a fancy word that means tourists can buy medical marijuana when they visit. Um, no, it doesn't. No. no, reciprocity <laughs> means that we have an exchange with another state that has legalized it will honor their, their um, license. It doesn't mean that a tourist can buy marijuana. Right, but if they have a medical marijuana oh, card that's that, is, yeah, <laughs> that is valid from another state or it's my understanding that if they have like a doctor's note or something. Um, no, they have they, to have a license. Have a license? Not a Even doctor's in states no. with recreational? Reciprocity means that they have to have a license. They have a licensing authority, we have a licensing authority, and we exchange that. Okay, yeah. Um, but in any case, so it would allow tourists to purchase marijuana if they can <coughs> prove that they do use medical marijuana for a medical condition. Uh, that's the biggest thing to come out of this bill. Um, another big thing for patient advocates is that currently, right now, patients have to go back to the doctor every single year to renew their card. For those patients with chronic conditions, this would actually allow them to hold off, so every three years they would have to go back to get their card renewed, so it makes it a little bit easier on those people who are really suffering. Um, it also would allow the sale of vaporizers. This is big for patients who you know, maybe they just prefer not to smoke or maybe it's really hard on their lungs for some reason. 
Is it kind of like an e-cigarette? Right. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Vaping. I've right. heard about it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Vapes. <laughs> <laughs> Just heard or read about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So this would allow uh, dispensaries to manufacture those pro uh, products and give them out to patients. Um, what this bill, it looked like it was going to do for a bit. Um, these provisions were stripped out at the last minute in conference committee. It would have allowed patients to buy edibles from dispensaries. Now the big concern there is that when patients have to make them on their own, they could risk dosing improperly and you know, that can be kind of scary. Um, there have been no overdoses from marijuana, um, but it could definitely, you could have some adverse effects there. Um, but you know, patients are going to have to continue making their own, at least in the short term. Um, it would have also established workplace protections. That's something that we've reported on. That's a pretty big deal. Uh, basically, what it would have said is if you have an employer that doesn't have an appreciation for medical cannabis and you test positive in a drug test, they can't fire you. Um, so you'd be protected in the workplace, you know, as long as you aren't. There are exceptions, right? So, like, if you are intoxicated at work, or for example, if you have to operate a vehicle for whatever reason for your job. So there are some exceptions, um, but yeah. And, and like I said at the last minute, those things were stripped out. What was left in the bill was that there would have been a working group to study those things. However, a working group already studied those things last year. I think it's fair to point out. Um, Majority Leader uh, Bilotti saying, no, no, there was not. <laughs> they, it, it, it made recommendations that perhaps the legislature should look into these things. For example, I think uh, it was the workplace protections. They had some more specific recommendations, but they did say this is possibly something that you should look into introducing legislation for. So, you know, I think there could definitely be room to look at these issues a bit more, but, you know, there are other states that Before do that, we go so. on to uh, the Police Standards Board, mm -hmm. why are we calling it cannabis now instead of marijuana, marijuana or pot or pacalolo? Mm -hmm. uh, right. When did that happen? Is it a branding thing? It is kind <laughs> of a branding <laughs> thing, yeah. I mean, marijuana advocates will say marijuana has this stigma. Um, you know, I'm not very well versed in this, yeah. but I think there is also, you know, uh, some view it as kind of like a racist term, marijuana, oh. across the border from Mexico. Really? Yeah, which is part of the rebranding issue. Interesting, um, interesting. Yeah, yeah, so uh, that's part of and it. And before we go on to the Police Standards Board, I, I just wondered if we might ask, uh, answer the question about recreational marijuana. Might there be, I think that's the, the essence of the question, is that ever going to happen? Recreational uh, marijuana. The status of the <coughs> recreational marijuana bills. Okay, well, I'll take a quick stab at it. I mean. You know, let's take a look, look at the trends in Hawaii, right? We have uh, always been the first to Little initiate lovers, something. I'm so sorry. Let's do look at the trends. We've always been, Hawaii's always been the first to initiate something. So let's go look at back. Oh, we we're the first to deal with um, same-sex marriage back in the early 90s. And then we're the last to actually enact. Medical marijuana, 2000. We're in the year, when did we finally do the, the, um, the botched dispensaries last year, right? So, you know, the trend is about a 20-year cycle from when we actually do something, put something in, but that's the trend. So, you know, I've been introducing bills to legalize uh, recreational marijuana for, for quite a number of years. And what I've seen is movement on the bills and movement on the topic and the discussion and people talking about it more and more, which is helpful because it moves a few inches, a few centimeters every year. Um, but if the trend holds, you know, that means uh, roughly 20 years when an issue hits the topic, the uh, topic hits Hawaii, and then we actually deal with it, um, we have a few more years to go. Okay. Speaker, marijuana? So recreational cannabis, I mean. So recreational, is, <laughs> I, I think it's a, it, that bill is introduced every year and it has been it in is. the past. I think Russell Ruderman was the uh, sponsor of one of the bills. I did one too. Oh, uh, Senator English as well. So my, uh, my, and I, I think I've introduced one before with mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Joe Suki, but um, we, uh, you know, I think my, my, um, my uh, perspective is that we need to implement the medical program first, uh, which has not yet happened, and we're still struggling with giving the administration the tools to do that. Uh, until that's done, I think that there might be, it might be a way to acclimate the general public towards 
uh, recreational use. Okay, just housekeeping rules, we're getting close to, to one o'clock and we have gotten through the majority of our panel discussion. It's all Q&A from here on out, but, but Courtney, I did want to bring up a bill that's been close, near and dear to the Civil Beat's heart. And by the way, I want to introduce some Civil Beat people in the audience. Jim Simon, our managing editor, right over there. Is Patty here? Is Patty? Sneak, of course, she sneaked down. Just cut that from the video, Bianca. So. <laughs> Other civil beat people. Corey, our photographer. Corey Lum, our great photographer in the back. Brian Black, not technically part of Civil Beat, but the uh, Civil Beat Law Center, right over there. Very important. And uh, probably someone else I'm forgetting, but I apologize. This is a bill that we have seen uh, not make it. And yet, if I understand correctly, Courtney, for the first time this bill is going to happen and Hawaii will join the other 49 states regarding legislation and the police. Is that right? Right, right. And this is a bill that I might add, Civil Beat has been watching it not happen for the past five sessions. So this session, um, we did get a bill. Um, but yeah, it was in 2013 that Civil Beat broke the news, our reporter Nick Ruby, that Hawaii is actually the only state in the nation that doesn't have a standards board for police officers. Now this sets minimum requirements, training standards, that sort of thing. It varies by state to state, but um, that's the general idea. Uh, the year after that, Senator Will Espero first introduced legislation to institute a board like this, and we've seen kind of similar bills every year after. This year, it was actually Representative Scott Nishimoto's bill. That's House Bill 2071 for anyone who's curious. I saw that the latest draft has been posted, so. But in any case, yeah, so we would join the other 49 states in setting these minimum standards. Um, there's a board of 15 people, four of those are members from the public, uh, as I recall. Several of them are uh, representatives from the department that this bill would affect. So it's not just police officers, right? It's also Department of Land and Natural Resources, enforcement officers, uh, even the Department of Taxation. <laughs> They've got cops. Yeah. Don't tax has cops? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not totally clear on <laughs> right. what they do, <laughs> but it would affect... Investigators, yeah. yeah. Please pause. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so it affects several different departments, of course, um, our prisons too. Um, but the other thing about this bill that is somewhat unique, there are some other states that do this, but others that don't, is that this board would also have, uh, it would also create at the same time a licensing and certification program. So it would have decertification powers. Uh, right now, Hawaii is one of five states that doesn't have a program like that as well. And the reason that the licensing and certification is really big is that if an officer, um, you know, it varies in different states, but say they use drugs or sexual misconduct and they're fired, this makes it so that they are decertified at the same time and they can't go to another agency and work um, as an officer. So, you know, we've seen that happen here. Uh, and this would prevent something like that, hopefully, from happening in the future. If so I'm not mistaken, there was the, the BLNR uh, security guard who got involved with, uh, assaulted, I think, essentially. A teenager. A teenager yeah. in Hilo, was it, was it the, actually the island there near Banyan Drive? And, and then and he had previously worked for HPD, and his right. record was known, and he was able to get rehired. So yeah. uh, a quick question to the, the speaker, the majority leader. What does that make you feel? Does it ever influence you when you start hearing, we are the only state out of the nation, <laughs> 49 people, states have gone with this and we're last. Does that, does that weigh on you at all and, and, and press you to get bills passed? It depends. I mean, you know, we sometimes being, it depends. You know, Hawaii is very unique and when, when we start weighing against uh, national standards, we don't have the same <coughs> circumstances as most other states. So. You know, it's very, very nebulous when you start weighing first or last, middle. It's about the quality of it that really gets, you know, for me, that if it's, if it's going to create something better for Hawaii, then the ranking really doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, what matters is that we do it right and we do it um, in a timely fashion. So, you know, that's how we tend to look at it. When people come with ratings that said, okay, your highways are the worst in the nation. Yeah, but, you know, we also have some of the best, uh, some other things. So. You know, it doesn't really play into how we craft, or at least how I would craft legislation. Okay, speaker? 
I agree with the client. Okay. Uh, questions. Um, what I'm doing is th these cards are being spread around to Courtney and Corey and I, and I also mm -hmm. have a list of online questions. But we'll start with, um, Co oh, you're over there. How'd you get over there? Look, they both went down there. <laughs> what is going on here? This is so weird. They <laughs> went far away. <laughs> I guess it really is time. Okay, Corey. That is you, Corey, right? We're keeping it on time. <laughs> We're totally keeping it on time, girl. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, well, we have a lot of questions about why several bills died. Okay. So, um, first is, what is the rationale behind, behind dismissing conferees for a lot of the bills earlier? In the okay, I, let's just stop right there. Uh, on the last day, or the day before perhaps, uh, Sylvia Luke, the finance chair, and I'm looking at the speaker for this, 20 or so bills, e discharged, uh, meaning the committee conferees are gone and the bill is dead. Why did that happen? Okay, so just for background, um, conference committee is where the Senate and House reconcile differences on their versions of the bill. And conference committee runs over a two-week period. It's in the last two weeks of April before we adjourn. And, um, you know, there are, I think, probably about 500 bills in conference this year, which is the, the, normal, the normal load. Um, so usually what happens is after, at the end of the two-week conference period, we have a deadline Friday, 6 p.m., you have to... Uh, reach an agreement on your bills. If you don't reach an agreement, then it's dead for the session. Um, this year, we took a different approach to uh, the conference process by discharging house conferees a couple days before that Friday deadline. And the reason why we did that, and this is on maybe a, uh, about three dozen uh, bills, was because <coughs> it was apparent that the conference committees would not reach a decision on those bills. And so the decision was made because we did not want to string out for two or three days negotiations over bills that really weren't going to make it. Uh, I think that <coughs> creates false expectations for the public. It creates false <coughs> expectations for members uh, in the legislature. And we just wanted to, to avoid that. So Jordan, are you comfortable with that practice or with the House? Well, did? that was the House practice. We, were, we didn't do that. So we just got the memos that forwarded that they put out forwarded to us by the Senate President and that's how we found out that bills died so obviously um, you know we didn't do that um, so it's a house practice it isn't a Senate practice we actually had one committee where it was on the airports corporation where our guys didn't know that they were dismissed so you had we were sitting there waiting um, and then somebody came in and said by the way it was you know discharged so um, yeah uh, it's not a practice of the Senate got it Courtney. Yeah, and uh, Speaker, one of those bills I think to which you were referring, uh, someone asked a question about UH's uh, grad student um, organization. Uh, they wanted to know why the House Speaker uh, that's denied you. public workers. <laughs> that's you. Uh, denied public workers <laughs> their right to collective bargaining by failing to allow the bill to proceed. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I'll just say the same thing, which is that it was apparent that the conference committees would not reach an agreement on that legislation. Um, I think one of the issues involved there was um, <coughs> that currently the public unions are facing a, uh, a lawsuit in the United States Supreme Court, which will, which probably will just materially affect their ability to uh, sustain themselves. Um, this is a case called, it's called the Janus case. It's basically a right, it's a right to work case. And if the Supreme Court um, rules against the unions, then uh, I think what you'll see is a radical restructuring of the public of the public unions throughout the United States. So at this point in time, I think one of the concerns was that we not add to public unions in this when there is uncertainty about what uh, the future is is like for them. Okay, Corey. How did bills like the styrofoam ban and the sanctuary city fare in the quote unquote most progressive legislative session? What is this quote unquote? You know, <laughs> it wasn't really progressive. Is that what the person I'm just said? Saying, it's quoted. Okay, the most progressive uh, legislative uh, session. Got it. And styrofoam and bill, polystyrene, or whatever it is. Okay, and what was the other one? It was um, in sanctuary city. Sanctuary city. Okay, uh, majority leader. Well, you know, as the speaker said, we have we had about 3,000 bills to begin with. Uh, by the time we got to conference, it's about 5,000. It's a weeding out process. Some things pass and some things don't. Speaker? 
Yeah, I'm not, I'm not exact. I actually don't really know why the styrofoam bill died. I think one of the issues probably was that the counties are beginning to act their own, enact their own uh, ordinances at the county level. So mm. there might be. I had heard that thing. Sylvia Luke held it in finance because there was a concern about potential job loss, although I didn't know that styrofoam was actually manufactured here. Uh, but I don't actually know the exact reason. Maybe we'll try and find out more. I have a question uh, but to both of you. Please explain why conference committee meetings take place behind closed doors. <laughs> oh boy, and how, how is this not a violation of the state's sunshine law? <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> okay, well, the legislature is actually exempt from the sunshine law. So I'm not, I'm not sure when that. I think that's probably, I'm not sure what year that was enacted, probably in the early 80s. 60s. I'm not sure. 80s. 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 Okay. So, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and this issue comes up a lot with the, uh, the working relationship between counties and, this, and the state where the counties have. The, the county councils are subject to the Sunshine Law, and so their argument is that, well, the legislature should be as well. And, you know, what I've pointed out is that the legislature is very different from the county governments. And when you look at the legislative branch, you know, we have two bodies as opposed to the councils, which have one body, just the county council, which is usually comprised of nine or less members, as opposed to the state and the house, which have 76 members. 25 in the Senate, 51 in the House. Mm -hmm. If you were to apply the uh, Sunshine Law to the legislature today, the one that applies to the council, you could not have members of overlapping districts. So for example, House and Senate mm -hmm. members from the same area could not meet together uh, if the Sunshine Law applied to them. So um, I know that there are, concern, there are concerns about the application of the Sunshine Law, but there are, for me, there are very practical reasons why the legislature should be exempt from it. So the Sunshine Law, uh, the majority leader was just sort of whispering, apparently you, Neil Abercrombie and Donna Kim had something to do with the Sunshine Law. I, I, I think that you know, the, the law around here was that they're the ones that wrote it and created it, so back in the day. Um, for those long-time people going, yep, yep. Do you think that's st still well, applied you know, today? You know what, I, uh, let, me, let me say this. I have tried a number of years to um, modernize the, the Sunshine Law because it was written in a time when we still remember before this, <laughs> before, and you actually had to fold a piece of paper and mail it out. So it was, it was created in a time when it was, the assumption was that how long does it take for a piece of mail to get out to someone? Mm -hmm. And that was the basis for mm -hmm. them creating it. Um, so that's why they built it seven days notice, uh, you know, all of these times. It's how long does it take for the notice to get out to people that wanted it? Now that we have telecommunications, a vast majority of people are using it. The councils have asked, said, you know, we, we need to move quicker. Can you update this? So we've tried to update it. And every time we've tried to update it, uh, people have come in and said, you are, you're taking away our ability to participate. No, we're not. We're just trying to make it so that government can operate. Um, in a modern era. Um, so those bills, have, those bills have always failed. But I want to get back to the question because, you know, um, what you talked about, what you asked us was uh, conference committee. You know, the, um, all of the hearings going through are for people to give their views to us, the legislators. Conference committee is the one time that the legislators sit and talk to each other about the bill. So yes, it, it happens in open, it happens here. We pass drafts back and forth. We talk to each other about provisions, but it's the one time that the public watches as we debate amongst ourselves. So that's, uh, that's what, a, what a conference committee is. It's to resolve the differences in the bill. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, I mean, I don't, there may be a perception it's done in closed doors, but the doors are wide open. People come in all the time and watch and see what we're doing. Uh, half the times the committee, the conference drafts are going back and forth as they're being produced, passed across the table, vetted out, and it moves very, very quickly. But it's to resolve the difference. I see your point. I will just follow up with that. Uh, the pesticide bill, SB 3095, uh, the, Mike Gabbard introduced a, a CD1 uh, the last day. Richard Cregan was the counterpart on, on the House. And uh, it wasn't made public what the CD1 said. It had a couple of changes. It wasn't all that different than the House's version of the bill. The one was it would extend to 2022, 
when to let the uh, pesticide be used, and I think there was an, another provision as well. But that CD1 also was not posted on the website, and so the, even though the doors may open, the public did not actually get to see the CD1. Well, most of the conferees probably didn't get to see it until they sat at that table and read it. Because that's how fast we're trying to, you know, we're trying okay. to resolve the difference. So is that's that a point disservice? We're to should should the, difference. the public have been, should that CD1 have been posted well, online? No, actually, because this is, like I said, this is when the legislators are talking to each other. And the public is a spectator in this particular one. The rest of the time, we're the spectators. We're sitting in the conferences, in the hearings, listening to the public talk to us about the bills. That's what the hearings are. You're guaranteed, supposedly, guaranteed three <laughs> hearings in each house, right? So for each bill. So that's where we listen to the public. This is the time we have to talk to our, each other to work out the differences. And these differences, these are, uh, I mean, really, if you look at the, the bills, it's, it's working out something that both houses can live with. So the members here sitting at the conference committee will get it as they pass it across. You see them passing out, we're all looking at it, reading it, and we say, okay, I can live with that because we debated this for almost four months. Um, most of the other members in the House and the Senate won't see it until it's in the, in the, on the floor. Okay. So the public, the, our members don't get it. The public doesn't get it. It's the conferees that get it and get to see it. Okay, thank you, Majority Leader. Corey. We have a question about um, uh, vacation rentals. What happened to the Airbnb bill? What happened to the Airbnb bill? Uh, this is three years in a row now. Uh, a dominant bill and it, it didn't make it. Uh, speaker, we'll start with your side, the House. Okay, so this is actually, a, I mean, this is just a really tough bill. And um, um, for me, the issue is that um, even if we wanted, even if we approved a bill this year, it, we would rely upon the counties uh, to enforce, to basically enforce this law. And right now you have uh, four counties that have completely different enforcement mechanisms in place. In fact, a couple of the counties don't, don't even really enforce anything when it comes to transient units. And to me, that is, a, that is something, that is a tough nut that we need to crack uh, before we pass a statewide uh, transient bill. Why is that? Is it because of home rule that the county should be able to determine on their own? I, I understand Kauai has a much better system, for example, than mm -hmm. Hawaii Island. I think Kauai's the probably the most been the most vigilant um, in enforcing their um, their ordinances, um, but it's basically zoning. It comes down to zoning issues, and each county is responsible for their own enforcement. Okay. Majority Leader, Airbnb. Mm. Um, you know, I'm not quite sure what happened with the bill. It went all over the place, but I can say this: you know, the counties are really reluctant to enforce because, well, why would they? Um, enforce and then lower the, the property tax and collect less money. So it's a conundrum, right? Hmm. The, the talk is there's a lot of uncollected revenue that could go into yeah. the general fund and yeah. there is also... Yeah, but it doesn't go to the counties, you understand. I so do. the counties um, have property tax and the values are high and it's a vacation <coughs> rental. They're like, okay, well, we'll kind of look the other way because you're saying our property, this property here is valued at a million dollars now, we can tax you at that. But if it wasn't for the vacation rent, if we were to enforce, you can now say your value is at 250000 And, you know, we're going to lose that much revenue to the county coffers. See, so that, that I think that's what I see as a big, um, big issue. Some different views in the audience. Yeah. Courtney. Yeah, we have a question about Ohana Zones. Uh, somebody wanted to know if they were modeled after any laws on the mainland, uh, and if so, what were they? And explain to us what an Ohana zone is, uh, a safe zone, I guess is what it is. But speaker first, and then Joy Leader. The model is um, Kalhiki Village on Nimitz Highway. Um, at, in January, before session started, the uh, House Finance Committee uh, took a site, a, tour, a site visit of Kalhiki Village. And you know what we saw there was, um, I, don't know if, if, I don't know if everyone's seen it yet, but basically the state uh, set aside um, a few acres for this project. Um, the city helped finance the infrastructure for that project. And then the private and nonprofit sector came in to construct the units, which they, the, the housing units are from Japan that were used during the, during the uh, tsunami uh, disaster. The units were flown in, the public and private, the pr private sector and nonprofit sectors constructed the units. The, the village is comprised of, um, of convenient, there's a convenience store, there's a preschool, 
There is a room of facility for medical and dental services. Uh, IHS is in charge of operating this, um, this, this village and has an office there as well. So this was, this was the model for the Ohana Zones. It's, um, it's basically a self, oh, and the other thing is it runs, it's not on the grid, it runs off of Tesla batteries. Hmm. So the whole thing is gonna be self, self-powered. And um, that I believe is where we need to go when it comes to the, the homeless population. It's, uh, it's, a transi- it's meant to be a transitional facility. Uh, it's near public transportation. It's near schools. It's near near jobs. You want to give people an opportunity to transition um, out of out of there. We're going into our last uh, 10, 15 minutes or so. There are cookies. There is coffee. There is water. There are bathrooms. Say everyone say goodbye to Mrs. Blair. Bye, Mrs. Blair. <laughs> Just like oh, uh, no inheritance for you, Chad. That's where it's gonna go. <laughs> It went to common cause. It went to common cause, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, minimum wage. The uh, Hawaii did finally come up uh, this year. What is it now? Ten ten? Is that what it is? Ten dollars and ten cents. Um, and this had been um, over <coughs> gradually introduced, uh, increased over the years. Uh, there were several bills. There has been talk about raising it to fifteen dollars an hour, as some uh, states and municipalities have been looking at. The concern is that a $10 minimum wage is not livable. That's the word that is used. Uh, what are your views on the minimum wage? Should it go up? Majority leader. I think so, but you know, there's all kinds of economic um, ramifications to that. So it's a hard one because we have the highest cost of living. You know, we're on par with New York City and on par with other very big metropolitans, but our pay scale doesn't meet that. So, you know, the idea, I mean, you look at the modern, modern wage system with uh, was it Henry Ford when he had his, you know, t- his um, manufacturing company and said, "Gee, I need to maybe shorten the work week so that these people would actually want to use a car and buy one, and then make them pay them enough so they could actually buy a car." So it was product driven, right? I mean, it had to. We had to give the people enough money and enough time to want the product. That's capitalism. What we have is we're giving the people nothing. We're raising the price way beyond reach, and we say, go get credit and, and just use a credit card on this and be in debt for your entire life. We start out students at about a quarter of a million dollars in debt. So, you know, I think the, the system may be fractured, and I, I agree with the higher minimum wage, but I don't know the economic impacts of it. Um, you know, and frankly, what we're doing is we're creating poor people. Did you want anything to speak? Yeah, so I think we, we need to, um, you know, I've asked the House to take a look at these issues collectively <coughs> because we have not just the minimum wage issue on the table, but next year there will be a report, hopefully, on the family leave program. Um, you know, we've also enacted recently, a, we've expanded the earning income tax credit for lower income workers. And so I think we have made attempts to try to, to try to bring, to provide some relief for, for working families. I know there's a lot more that needs to be done. But my only request is that the legislature act on it collectively and not piecemeal. Okay. Corey. I could actually, um, I have a question. Sure, Courtney, go ahead. Go Sorry, Courtney. With your discussion. Uh, somebody wants to know what pass that helps low wage and middle income folks. Specifically, they mentioned uh, minimum wage, family leave, sick days, tax reform. So the question is uh, what pass that helps low wage and middle income folks? What legislation passed this session? Yeah. Okay. Well, the, the homeless, the homeless, the homeless bills we're, we're hearing, the affordable housing. I mean, that's you know that's a big one because we're. It's a recognition that, like I said, you know earlier, we previously we dealt with homelessness as as you become after you're homeless, then we we try to deal with it. So we changed that and trying to deal with it before you get there. Um, there's a lot of resources that was allocated, Scott. How much about altogether? Maybe s- over half a billion dollars, right? So it's the very first time that we've allocated that much money. Um, but you know, specifically, I mean, if you're talking about tax credits and things like that, I don't think we have very One much. One of the things that was raised, I believe this was in the Republican package, and I think you reported on it. I think this comes up every year. Why not eliminate the general excise tax on food and groceries? Mm. Anyone? Speaker? Well, 
you know, I would love, I mean, I would love to do that personally. Um, uh, the general excise tax, um, on the other hand, is the largest revenue source for the state government. Uh, it collects, it brings in more revenue than the, inc the income tax does. And, you know, we're at a point now where, and I'll just kind of juxtapose this, you know, where um, the teachers union is asking us to ra raise more revenue for the public schools. Uh, if we were to cut GET, then the allocation for the public schools would, de would also decrease at a time when people feel that there are some needs that have not been adequately funded at those levels. So it's, I mean, I think it's easy to say uh, we should cut, cut those areas, but there is a, there is a price to pay for that. It's an excise tax, right. Uh, speaking of the teachers union, uh, a big surprise this session, the constitutional uh, amendment question that will go before voters in the fall that would give the legislature the authority to, and correct me if I'm wrong on the exact language, but to, to get more tax money, property tax money, from uh, investment <coughs> properties, which I presume are expensive properties. I didn't say that very well. There is some concern. A lot of people are happy that you're gonna get more money for teachers. Some have raised concern that, oh, the legislature will just use that to raise the, fu raise the fund and take the money and put it in, in the general fund. Can, what assurances can you give us that that money will in fact, uh, assuming it passes this fall, well, be used for the teachers? What passes this fall is a constitutional amendment. And if it, if it passes, um, then we have we have to figure out the specifics of a bill because the counties raise property tax counties have exclusive right now they have exclusive ability to collect property tax <coughs> that's their only source of revenue so where would the revenue come from do you think well okay so let's uh, I'll just give you the county of sure. Maui's perspective you know in Maui the way that we our county does it is any property that you do not have your homeowners exemption on is an investment property so that's how it's defined, and I'm talking to the other counties, that's generally how they define it as well. Okay, speaker? Yeah, so the constitutional amendment that we uh, approved um, would call for a surcharge on investment property. And investment property is not defined in the constitutional amendment. That would be left to a future legislature if the, if the amendment um, is ratified by the voters. You know, um, the Senate did, um, uh, initiate this bill, and when the Senate draft came over, uh, the language in that constitutional amendment was more specific because it targeted property uh, where there would be no homeowner exemption and where the property is valued at one million dollars or more. That mo that language was based on the city's residential A <coughs> property tax classification, which is attempting to target to raise uh, the property tax for that category of property. That residential A classification is in litigation now. Uh, it's in the circuit court. It's probably going to be appealed to the Supreme Court. So the House's position was that it was not the time to use uh, a standard that is questionable. Okay. Um, one more question from Courtney and Corey, or rather Corey and Courtney. <laughs> and Ben um, Nishimoto, our philanthropy director, if he's still around here, wanted to close with just a few comments. Uh, so I'll turn first to Corey. You have one more question? I have many questions, but... <coughs> just pick one or two if you can say it fast. Yeah. Um, well, a lot of them revolve around uh, criminal justice reform, and I guess most of it, I guess, would, you know, they're asking how funding a new prison... Um, affects other criminal justice reforms. Okay, uh, I think the current plan is uh, OCCC being relocated to Halava. Is there money for that? I don't know where we are on that. We didn't talk much about prison f reform this session. Uh, uh, speaker. So I think that we've only appropriated funds for the uh, planning and design of okay. a replacement facility. Okay, not the actual building right. construction. Right. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. There still has to be a, uh, an EIS. Right. Is there a follow-up or a related question? <laughs> or a different, different question? Di different topic. Is it interesting? <laughs> uh, what happened to the Kupuna Caregivers Bill? Well, there's a good one. What did, uh, as I understand it, uh, there was more funding, not as much as was requested, but it, I think they did double the amount, but I'll turn to the experts here. Okay, I have a response. Yeah, let him go, because. Go for it, Scott. I know people may, people may not want to hear my response. I think that there one bill said give it two million, another one said four million. I think they ended up giving it. Okay, so the the, the legislation calls for a seventy dollar a day per mm. diem for a caregiver, 
And according to the office, state office on aging, there are approximately 200,000 caregivers in the state of Hawaii. So if you gave a per diem to each of those caregivers for five days a week, $70 times five days a week, the cost of that program would be $4 billion a year. $4 billion, okay. I have, I have a concern that the Office on Aging did not properly implement this program last year. I think it rushed through the process of Im implementation. Basically, what, we're, what happened was we appropriated funds for this program last year. The program was implemented, and because of the dollar amount that was appropriated, only X number of people could actually enroll in that program. So the first 200 or 150 people who signed up are the ones who are now entitled to this per diem. What the House and the Senate did this year was to limit per diem payments to one payment per week as opposed to five days per week so that you could quadruple the number of people who would pr be receive some kind of payment. Because you are cutting the amount of money that individuals would get in order to take care of more people, of more ones. caregivers. Okay, all right. Uh, last question to Courtney. So we have a question about this person named some different infrastructural things, most of which I think under the city's jurisdiction, but what about like DOT roads or is there anything in that vein that passed this year? Money to help state roads? Yeah, state roads, park yeah. benches, lighting, that kind of thing. Jordan? Well, I can tell you from Maui, we're very, we're very grateful. We have um, Lahaina Bypass, Paia Bypass, um, both areas that are needed, and it's the second round for the Paia Bypass. The first time the people of Paia turned it down. And the same people that turned it down and are asking us to please put it in, and then now they may not want it again. So, you know, uh, but that's the that's the process, right? So, Lahaina <coughs> bypass, um, it's been mo it's it's in phases. Parts of it are being put in. Um, you know, the traffic on the neighbor islands are pretty 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 bad. Um, so, you know, I'm happy to see some money's at least going to the neighbor islands for this. Yeah, yeah, we appropriate tens of millions of dollars to the transportation department every year, and they have, they line those up with specific roads, you know, projects, roads, easements, things like that. So there's like a it's a whole laundry list of, of projects. Okay, well, we'll stop there. I do want to give Ben Nishimoto, our director of philanthropy, the la the last word here. Hi. Right, so thanks everyone for coming. Uh, this is our third and final legislative uh, civil cafe. Um, and I, I see a lot of familiar faces and civil league member supporters here, so I may be preaching the crop choir. Uh, but I, for those who don't know, um, Civil Beat is a 51C3 nonprofit. We transitioned back in June of 2016, and um, you know we're starting our May spring campaign. Our goal is to raise forty thousand dollars. Every dollar that we do raise, because we are a nonprofit, goes directly back into our newsroom. Um, and we feel like we have a mission to fill specific media gaps here. Um, so my, my call out to you all uh, is if you have given to a political candidate, um, that's fantastic. Um, but please also consider giving to the organization that tries to hold them accountable. So thank you all for coming. And until um, the next event, mahalo.